Well, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for Investment Connection Colorado. We're going to give it just another minute. If you don't mind, uh, we still have folks that are joining the conversation. So, again, we'll be right back in another minute. Again, thanks for being with us for Investment Connection. As I said, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for Investment Connection Colorado. This is the second year um, we've held virtual sessions uh, for Investment Connection. Some of you may recall uh, our Investment Connection response to COVID-19 sessions in May 2020, when we were in a very dark place with pandemic and economic crisis. Of course, our low and moderate income communities have not recovered and uh, in particular our communities of color, and uh, many had not fully recovered from the previous crisis. By the way, we do have the recordings and materials on the website from the 2020 sessions. For those of you that are new to Investment Connection, the best way uh, to think about it might be a Shark Tank or as a venture capital pitch session, uh, but it's designed for community development organizations and you, the funders from banks, foundations, philanthropists, state, federal, and local government are the friendly sharks. So we developed Investment Connection in 2011, so now in its 10th year, to assist bankers with diverse CRA opportunities and other funders that are focused on LMI households and communities, also for community organizations needing to raise awareness of the uh, issues they're addressing and to raise funds and other support from the funding community. So today you're going to hear from eight organizations with compelling proposals in Colorado. Each presenter will have seven minutes for their presentation, followed by three minutes of Q&A. Funders, you have a Q&A button on to your right to submit your questions that I'll pose to the presenters. Now, I have to tell you, you have to be quick in submitting uh, questions because uh, the session does go by quickly. So, uh, you should have received yesterday at about 3 o'clock from Lori Growth and myself uh, an email with the agenda, the funder response form, and evaluation for today's event. You can pull those out to follow along to the agenda, but of course, we'll also be covering that here today. Those of you that have attended the in-person events know as funders, I usually ask you to pull out the funder response form from your packet and fill out the top. The top's basically your identifying information, your contact information. Then I want you to remember that, well, for those of you that are new, this form is not a commitment to fund, but simply expressing interest in learning more about the organization and the proposal. The form lists the eight proposals with a uh, yes or no. So after each presentation, you can mark with your uh, interest as far as if you'd like the organization to follow up with you. Uh, and again, that's not a commitment to fund. It's basically saying, I'm just interested in learning a little bit more about this organization. Now, what we have uh, in addition to that is we're also offering a response option uh, that's going to be popping up uh, when we reach the, the question and answer session uh, with each presentation. And so it'll pop up and you'll basically have the opportunity to say yes or no. And we'll be recording that as far as your response, as far as if you're interested in connecting with an organization. Again, as I said, it's not a commitment fund. It's basically um, your opportunity to know about the uh, uh, learn a little bit more about the organization and does it fit uh, your, your strategy for your organization. So we've connected over 44 million 
in our district in loans, investments, grants, and services that's been reported, hundreds of computer donations, and thousands of CD service hours, volunteer hours. This could be connections that are made, folks that are serving on boards of directors, advisory committees, uh, uh, loan review committees, those kinds of things for CRA, CD service hours, and also in-kind services that are often provided. So on the next slide, you'll see, um, let's get that up, that I, uh, the emphasis here that I have in regards to uh, the, the funder's response form and the evaluations. And to remember that, you know, uh, you still have to conduct your due diligence as far as uh, organizations that you're looking at and for CRA officers. You would basically uh, do the same practice that you would with any CRA activity. Okay, next slide, please. So, for those of you that have a multi state, oh, I think we missed a maybe gone. There we go. For those of you that have a multi state, funders that have a multi state presence, uh, investment connection is available. Uh, with my other colleagues in, in diverse uh, communities. So, uh, and most recently, uh, we had Investment Connection Appalachia, which was uh, part with the Richmond Fed and the Cleveland Fed. Uh, we had Investment Connection Puerto Rico in, in, in um, last year, very early in the year. So, we've had activities uh, in over 23 uh, programs uh, last year. So, quite a bit that's taking place. So, next slide. So is getting us to, as I said, that funder response form that we've already talked about. And again, due diligence uh, as, as a funder. So uh, with that said, I think we're, let me make sure I have all my, yep. With that said, let's go ahead to the next slide and we're gonna be able to get this started. Let's get started with our first presentation. Alejandro Dopico and Tony Frank with PCs for People. Alejandro, the floor is yours. Hi. Hi, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Ariel. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Alejandro Dopico. I'm the executive director of PCs for People Colorado. Uh, first, thank you so much for the opportunity of being here today as our participation in 2019 provided the support that allowed us to triple our capacity in our Northeast Park Hill facility. Um, first, a little introduction, uh, really quick. PCs for People is a 501c3 social enterprise with the mission of addressing the digital divide at scale. Okay. Colorado was the first out of state expansion from Minnesota, and now we grew into a national organization with presence in eight states. So, I think the most important question is what do we do to address the digital divide? Well, instead of asking for donations, we got the highest certifications in the industry um, for responsibly recycling electronics. Uh, with these certifications, now what we can do is one, source, refurbish, um, we source, we refurbish, uh, we distribute, we support, and we educate. Okay, for sourcing, we, uh, we um, divert out of the landfills more than 2 million pounds of electronics in 2020. We refurbish with all these materials, we refurbish all the computers, tablets, phones, everything that a family can use for, for being connected to the internet. And we distribute, okay? Distributing, we did uh, more than 40,000 computers since the pandemic started. That is uh, hundreds of thousands of individuals impacted with an uh, average of 3.3 members in the family. And um, all families to get a computer from us or internet, they need to qualify. They need to be under the 200% of the poverty level, which is uh, 53,000 for a family of four and 26 for an individual. Some really important data is like 60%, 60 of the families that we provide a computer never have a computer before. That is huge. 
Also, besides individuals, we also distribute to schools, non-profit, affordable housing uh, organizations, and we have an online store that provides computers to all 50 states. So that's the distribution, but now one also of the most important things is like we do not stop there. We also support, so our computers have one year warranty. They have, we have a call line um, phone when, where the individuals can, that acquire a computer can call and say, hey, my internet is not working, what will I do? And we do this diagnostics at no cost. And probably the most important things is like, we cannot stop there just by providing the tool. So we are really excited for in the next two weeks, launch our education program where individuals uh, can that never had a computer before can learn the basics, but also we are going to provide IT certifications for uh, adults, um, uh, adults and youth to go into the workforce. Another question is, how can you support pieces for people? We call it time treasure technology. Time, um, your, your employees can donate their time and help us in the process of getting these computers out in the community. Treasure, where a 501c3 uh, organization, so uh, donations are accepted, are accepted. But the most important is technology. And we are not asking for your technology. What you're asking is for your recycling contract. Like, just listen to what we have to offer compared to the competition, uh, take a decision. So thank you so much for listening. I'm going to pass the mic now to Tony Frank. He's going to present our proposal to how to bring high speed internet to rural areas in Colorado and to low income neighborhoods here in Colorado. We are really excited of this new project also. So I, we, I want Alejandro. I, I wish him for you later. Thank you. Great job, Alejandro. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to talk fast. I know uh, Ariel is telling us we've got seven minutes. Really appreciate this opportunity again. Thank you so much. I, I work under the great leadership of Alejandro in Denver, but I've also joined our new national team that's called the wireless internet service provider team. I'm going to talk about that here as Alejandro mentioned oh, he, on that slide. We talked about a mobile hotspot service that we do provide. That service uses something called the educational broadband service spectrum, and we've provided over 60,000 accounts with that mobile hotspot. But there's a cap. There's a cap on how many um, families we can work with under the EBS, the educational broadband service spectrum. It has a range of about 10 to 40 megabits per second, which can be good. But we want to provide even faster speed and, and, and more reliable speed to, to the families that that we work with. Um, and our EBS service, as we mentioned, has to be with those that make under 200% of federal poverty. We have to verify that each year. And unfortunately, what happens with that current program when they go over 200% of federal poverty, they then we have to have them out of that program, out of that internet service, which can be an unfortunate thing. So with the cap, with not the speed that we want, and with some of these um, challenges of having people to, to, to move off our internet, we are proposing to establish our own high speed fixed wireless networks in Colorado that will support low and moderate income communities. Um, and we want to target communities with a high percentage that are not connected and rural communities that don't even have the option for high speed Internet. Um, so we want to provide faster high speed Internet at 50 megabits down 10 megabits per second up. Um, uh, having more flexibility to not have to kick people off immediately if, if they go over 200% of the federal poverty level to continue to be a key support for, for, for their success. And the ability to increase our capacity to ensure that we are offering high speed Internet. So this is. This is happening now since March of 2021, we have deployed 5 WISP projects, wireless Internet service projects, primarily in the Cleveland area and in Milwaukee. We are receiving support from the Microsoft Airband initiative to do that. So, what is this model that we're that we're working on right now? Um, it uses existing fiber. Uh, we establish a monthly lease agreement that allows PCs for people to be the Internet service provider for a community. We can work with. Dark fiber, basically fiber nearby and bring that into a new building. We can also work with lit buildings, a building that already has fiber and share a portion of that fiber to be able to broadcast something called the citizens broadband radio service spectrum. I mentioned EBS. This is now a different spectrum that has become available in July of 2020 by the FCC. It's called CBRS. It uses the 3.5, 3.7 gigahertz spectrum. Um, 
It, it had been strictly reserved for the military and government use, primarily the Navy. I can tell you Colorado does not have uh, much Navy involvement. It uses 4G and 5G equipment um, to broadcast this over a two square mile area. So we're looking to do projects that would be a two square mile area. One project being in Northeast Park Hill, where 23% of the households do not have an internet connection in the latest data for the American Community Survey. And working with working with many in this audience here today to, to identify a rural community where this model can, can be a good fit. And we expect to, to have the same price as our mobile hotspot, which is $15 a month to be able to sustain and expand these networks. Uh, final slide, please. So two, we're requesting two things. One, we're requesting support to help uh, convene meetings in rural areas where we can identify stakeholders and rural communities that would be interested in this model to address a need they have for high-speed internet um, and to begin to provide technical experience on how this model may work. And it would also help to begin to identify where available fiber is. So it really is kind of a technical support, convening type of support. And then we're looking to develop two projects. Uh, one, again, it's in a Northeast Park Hill and urban project and one in a rural area, each project being about $160,000 um, each. And we are looking to commit some of our funding um, to help do this as well, uh, but mainly focused on an investment or grant opportunity. And how did we do on time, Ariel? Did we, did we make it underneath? <laughs> we're, 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 we're doing well. So All right. uh, question, question for you guys. So, and, and I did notice on your slide that it basically said uh, Colorado rural community. And, and I was wanting to know, how, what are you going to use as your selection criteria uh, for that? But prior to that, let's go. I want to make sure it's clear to the funders as to what you're asking for, because you have uh, an investment opportunity and a grant opportunity. So if you can quickly cover both of those. Yes, so I mean, of course, uh, you know, a grant, <laughs> a grant would be our, our first option, but we are, we are open to other ways to begin to, to you know, to, to partner and looking at, um, you know, is, is there a way for some kind of additional ownership from, you know, from a community part of this? We are interested in that. So a blend of both a grant and some type of investment, we are very open, open to that. Um, you know, we are working in some cases within in Ohio where um, we we are installing the equipment and, and, and developing the model, but there is ownership um, that's occurring with a local community group. So we are open to those kinds of options too. Okay, uh, let me ask this. So a uh, question that came in, have you talked to CDOT about their dark fiber in rural locations? And then that's question one, but also suggest you check in with COGS and EDDs, Economic Development Districts, in rural locations, Southwest uh, SWCCOG, Southwest, but anyway, uh, Council of Government yeah. in Durango would be a good place to start. So it sounds like awesome. somebody's yeah, that's our checklist. plug in. That's our checklist. So I want to thank that that uh, person very well. That's, those are the connections we want to make. Those are the things that we want to do. We've worked in Denver with a lot of the private networks. We are part of the Denver Digital Equity Coalition and part of developing a city plan and interested in some things in Denver, but in the rural areas, that's some of the support that we need to figure out. Uh, tell you what, so we we were kind of there on time. I don't see any other questions. Let's put up the poll. So, well, not that it's a poll, but really the funder response. Uh, so, those of you that have heard the uh, presentation from PCs for People, uh, you have a funder response form, but also on the side, uh, would you like to connect with PCs for People? Yes, no. Your decision. As I said again, it's not a commitment to fund. It's basically saying. Uh, I'd like to find learn a little bit more about the organization, the people, the proposal itself. So, uh, guys, thank you very much for your presentation. Certainly do appreciate it. Funders, don't forget yes, no in regards to PCs for people. And you also have a funder response form that was shared with you. And so, thank you. So, let's move to the next slide, please. Mike O'Donnell with Prairie Rose Development Corporation. Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ariel. Good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mike O'Donnell. Uh, I'm looking for funding. We might go to the next slide. Uh, my proposal is seeking funding to create a statewide Kiva hub. Um, that hub would be operated by Prairie Rose Development. And again, we'll grab to the next slide. Uh, Prairie Rose Development is a new 501c3 I helped found after retiring from Colorado Lending Source last year. Our mission there is to stimulate the creation, prosperity, economic welfare of diverse small businesses, creating sustainable living wage jobs within their communities. 
Uh, Kiva is a really interesting uh, nonprofit itself. Started in 2005, came back on mainland United States in 2011 after the last re Great Recession, and really its first rung on the capital ladder funding for uh, many low to moderate income um, small businesses, women owned businesses, minority owned businesses. And it's a unique program because the funding is provided by the crowd. It's crowdfunding, crowd lending. Um, it operates through a network of hubs um, and trustees across the United States. Um, we have here, or at least in 2020, uh, there are about 1.8 million lenders, individuals, teams, organizations, banks, even charities and churches make loans under the Kiva platform. Um, in 2020, there were uh, 1,109 borrowers participated in the Kiva program nationwide. About 250,000 lenders participated. The average loan is about $7,125. 67% of those loans went to women, 64% went to people of color, 37% to black, a lot to immigrants and refugees, and a, mo a lot to what we call the really the financially underrepresented. So we might jump to the next slide. The problem that really Kiva is addressing is that there's actually 26 million American entrepreneurs who lack access to affordable capital. If we look at a Federal Reserve Kansas City report from 2010, it estimated that in Colorado alone, we had about 5% of the population here was unbankable and about 16.1% of the population was underbankable. Based on the latest census, that's 1.2 million Coloradans really do not have access to the banking system that otherwise, otherwise they may have, uh, which would means they're pretty much excluded from access to, to credit through more traditional sources, even nonprofit sources. From a micro lending perspective, making small loans, and the example here is a $2,500 loan, um, a, a CDFI would typically have to charge about 80-80% APR to actually break even on a loan like that. Kiva, by not using regular routes and by going to the crowd, is able to provide 0% interest rate loans, no fees, so the borrower pays nothing to access the loan, loans from $1,000 to $15,000, terms up to 42 months, and it's really created by 120 to 130 individuals per loan will actually fund that loan. We did actually have a Kiva hub in Denver last year, which I started at Colorado Lending Source. Uh, my replacement there chose not to continue that hub, uh, but when we operated it last year for the metro area, just for the Denver area, not for the whole state, we were able to work with 13,301 lenders who participated in 122 loans that we did, 868,000. Average on just $1,000. Um, but what's really interesting of the 13,000 lenders, only 87% of them were from the US and very few of them were from Colorado. So what we did with the Kiva program is bring a lot of fresh money into the state to make loans to small businesses who otherwise would have no access to funding to try and get those businesses off and, off and running. Um, uh, most of the loans we did last year were for women owned businesses. Uh, we did do 44.6% of loans to minority owned businesses, including about 13, 14% to uh, people of color or black owned businesses. And next slide, please. And really what I'm looking for funding here with Prairie Rose is to try and create a hub for the whole state of Colorado. You'll see this map that shows where all the hubs are across the US. The fact that here in Metro Denver, we're able to do 11% of the total volume of the entire Kiva platform across the country last year means that there's a big gap we have now because the Kiva hub does not exist in Denver. Hubs are really locations that have an employee called the capital access manager who really has the boots on the ground or if we're in Boulder, it's the crocs on the ground to really provide the resources to interact with the businesses to connect them with the technical assistance providers like SPDC, SCORE, Mikasa, to try and bring them to the stage where we can then put them onto the Kiva platform to get them ready for a crowdfunding effort. Just one example of a business we worked with last year was uh, Urima, who actually moved to Colorado in 2015 after she escaped the humanitarian crisis in, in Venezuela. Um, she went through a class at Mikasa in 2016. Um, she actually went through a, a leadership class with the Aurora Community Connection, um, and she actually started a business that really built on what her skills were in Venezuela, which was jewelry. She now employs uh, eight uh, immigrant women to help her with a project called 
uh, Manas and Pranadaras or entrepreneurial hands. So she's got eight talented artesian women. She got a $6,000 loan under Kiva, 138 individuals and groups came together to fund that loan. And she's now doing very successfully with her business. Um, I wanted to mention as I mess my notes up, essentially, um, the membership fees, essentially, the other ways that businesses can participate in the Kiva is, of course, running the hub. And that's what I'm looking for funding to do is to actually buy the license, if you like, from Kiva for the state, which is a $50,000 fee, and then hiring capital access manager individuals in different parts of the state to be the boots on the ground. Um, and again, to interact with the community to try and make people more aware of the program and how it might be a first rung on the ladder to bring people back into the banking system, to bring people back into the CDFI lenders, to bring people back into other sources of financing as they grow their businesses and hopefully create jobs. We have had over the last year, as you be aware, not that many businesses starting and usually the Colorado economy is really fundamentally based on businesses opening. Businesses closing, we have typically almost as many business closes each year as open. Businesses expanding and businesses contracting. We've certainly had the businesses closing, we've had the businesses contracting, we've had a few businesses expanding, but we haven't seen the businesses start this last 12 months, which is the reason why Colorado is still the 34th ranked state when it comes to unemployment, as opposed to being the ninth ranked state prior to the pandemic. Uh, so there's lots of opportunities for uh, managed loan funds. Um, Bank of America, for example, has a $1 million matching fund for women-owned businesses. Last year in Colorado, Deutsche Bank, uh, who gets CRA credits from the Fed in New York, uh, made all of the loans, made lots of matching loans to our women and minority-owned businesses. Uh, a lot of groups, uh, large groups, a lot of employer groups uh, participate in the Kiva managed loan funds or providing funds for their employees to make loans under Kiva. So 1.8, 1.9 million individuals like me making loans under the Kiva platform, $25 loans. I get a 0% return, but I get my 69 cents paid back each month from the borrowers that I lend to. Um, and with that, I can return it back to you, Ariel. I might've actually done it in less than seven minutes. Who knows? Right on time, Mike. So very okay. good. Thank you so much. Uh, to kick off with a couple of questions. So your request is for $250,000. And what would what form would that look like? Are you looking at uh, grants, which which uh, always welcome, I'm sure. Uh, investment like an EQ2 uh, would a line of credit uh, assist. I know you're talking about zero interest loans, so help us yeah. and help the funders understand your your request yeah. a little bit more. And that's a really good question. The reason perhaps why Kiva is not all widespread, and perhaps the reason why my success is discontinued, it, it doesn't really generate. Revenue. So it would bring friends to the program running for two to three years at the same time as building up other aspects of Prairie Rose to create revenue generating opportunities. As we bring people from startup early stage, which is mostly what Kiva does, into that second rung, then there's perhaps opportunities for Kiva. So I would be looking for grant fundings at least to get me going, um, at least for a couple of years until I can make the program self sustainable from funding outside the Kiva platform. And speak to us about geography. Uh, is this your intent that it's, uh, I know in your proposal, it said statewide for the state of yes. Colorado. How yeah. does that work? And also would uh, funders be able to designate a particular assessment area geography uh, that they have interest in? Yes, and that's that's the way again, it's just like with Bank of America is only interested in helping women owned businesses, uh, people who participate, who perhaps want to match funds or invest funds. And we did this with Castle Rock last year during the pandemic, where Castle Rock community really created their own little local fund to invest in Castle Rock businesses. So my intent is to be statewide. You can see that there's nothing in Wyoming, Kansas or New Mexico, but that can be a discussion at another investment connection. Uh, I would need people. We've done a, a pretty decent job in Denver, so I want to bring that back. But we've left out Fort Collins and Colorado Springs and Pueblo and Durango and Grand Junction. So um, having the license as a statewide would allow me to hire uh, capital access people in each of those bigger communities so that we can spread the word and get more into the rural communities as well, too. And the, the the pipeline, what do you see from, from your experience with last year with um, uh, Colorado lending source and the, the the need is that has there been any um, market done and marketing done in regards to what that 
demand is as far as the pipeline? Yeah, we could we could look at that. We have typically, or at least the last full year, we have data for about 23,000 new businesses opened in Colorado with employees, which means that there were probably about another 60, 70, 80,000 that opened as sole proprietors. We'll probably see very few with employees opening in the last 12 months or even the next 12 months. We'll probably see a lot more people as they flee the workforce, which we've seen a little bit of starting their own businesses. And typically to start a business, you, you might need about $5,000. Typically, it's it, these people have been impacted by COVID. They're typically not the same credit scores. They may not have credit scores at all. So to answer your question, the 122 loans we did just in Denver is really just scratching the surface, you know, building the relationship with the chambers, the Black Chamber, the Amateur Asian Chamber, the Latina Chambers. All of that is just building the education and awareness, working closely with our partners at the CDFIs and the SPDCs and scores. And Mikasa is just getting the word out that this is the first stage. It's relatively riskless in the sense that there might be 130 people, and I've got a $25 loan as part of that pot. We got a repayment rate of 92% plus last year, so not every loan comes back, but $25 isn't the end of the world. We have American consumers now have almost $3 trillion parked in banks as in terms of savings which is really the, a high number that we've ever seen. And this is a way potentially for people who are perhaps better off to try and help those individuals who are perhaps less well off to try and get you know, wealth creation for themselves and their families by starting a business. So that's really my passion here is really working with this. We, if we're looking at about 80,000 starts in Colorado every year, typically scratching the surface, if we couldn't do a couple of hundred loans, we'd, we wouldn't be trying hard, so. Okay. Mike, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation today. Uh, funders in the room or in the session, uh, you'll find also under the polling section to your right, uh, would you like to connect with Prairie Rose Development Corporation? Yes, no. And also don't forget if you have your uh, electronic copy of the funder response form, you could also be completing that uh, as well. So if we could move to the next slide, please. And I'm going to ask, uh, Howard Brooks to join us. Howard with Energy Resource Center. Welcome. And Howard, Hello, everybody, you thank you for being here today. Um, wanted to first say that we get all of our refurbished computers from PCs for people. So Alejandro and Tony, good to see you on the call. Uh, first slide, I, I want to talk about energy poverty. So for the average Coloradan, you know, we're spending one, maybe 2% of our disposable income to pay our utility bill. But for many low income people in Colorado, you know, they're spending sometimes 20 or even 30% of their disposable income, you know, paying their utility bill. We encounter retirees living on social security who get maybe $900 a month in social security and have over a $300 utility bill. So energy poverty can make affordable housing unaffordable. You know, we like to say that if you can't afford your utility bill, you know, you can't afford to live where you're living. So for renters and for owners both, uh, we see a real problem with energy poverty. There are about 250,000 Colorado families in our territory that qualify for free weatherization. And when I say that, I mean, really, what we do is cut energy waste. We're going in and doing an energy assessment on the home. We're doing all of the work to make that home uh, cutting edge, really energy efficient. So that involves air sealing, insulation, new, new HVAC equipment or refrigerator. Um, we do all of the, all the measures you see on the slide here, including uh, rooftop and ground mount solar. Next slide, please. So our company, Energy Resource Center, has four different locations. We're headquartered in Colorado Springs. We have an office in Alamosa, in Denver, and in Loveland. And from those four locations, we have 106 staff who are working in people's attic and crawl space while we're on this call today. So we are the, we're the trucks and tools people. We're the ones actually performing the work and making homes energy efficient. Um, there is a, an important financial benefit to the low income families to make their house more affordable. There's also a good environmental pro 
piece of what we do because in the last year we were able to keep nearly 4 million pounds of CO2 out of the atmosphere by cutting energy waste. And you know that, that 4 million pounds is this year when we did the work, next year, the year after, you know, for as long as that insulation is in that attic or in those walls, you know, those environmental and financial benefits continue to accrue to the family in that home. So what we're trying to do, and the reason we have this request in is really um, these homes that low income people live in, they're not only the least efficient, but they're also in some cases not in great condition. They haven't been maintained well. Uh, oftentimes the family doesn't have, you know, disposable income to do, you know, simple upgrades that keep their home, you know, healthy and safe. So we find live knob and tube wiring in people's walls and in their attic. And that's a huge fire hazard. Um, this is wiring from the early 1900s that is unsafe and needs to be replaced. We find roof leaks. We find roofs that are in terrible repair, sewer leaks, plumbing leaks, uh, all different types of repairs that need to be made to the home. Now, ERC is an energy efficiency company. We're not a home repair company, but we want to do home repairs that are related to the measures we're installing. So, in other words, there's no point in adding insulation to an attic if it's just going to get wet because there's a huge roof leak. So we're looking for more funding to be able to support uh, us being able to serve more clients. And so oftentimes kind of the worst homes are the ones that need the most help. And that's where a little additional funding, hopefully in the form of grants would would help us in our in our quest to make homes efficient. Uh, again, we serve 27 counties. It's all of the Front Range and in uh, the San Luis Valley and the far north and northeast parts of the state. And in the final slide, uh, I want to talk about the outcomes that are, are created by the work that we do. Um, this last year, we've touched about 2,000 homes, and that's a pretty standard figure for the last several years. Uh, so we're chipping away at that quarter of a million uh, households that qualify for free help, but you can see we still have a lot of homes to go. Uh, for the homes that we do full uh, deep energy retrofits on, we're saving about 25% on their annual utility bills, and that's an average. So if somebody lives in a, in a newer place, more efficient to begin with, you know, that might be five or 10%. But then there's other homes where they're in terrible condition and we end up saving them you know, 40 or 50% on their annual utility usage. You know, this program reduces the pressure on the federal program that provides utility bill assistance. And I liken it to having a coffee mug that has a, a hole in the bottom of the mug. You know, you keep pouring coffee in, but it keeps pouring out the bottom of the mug. And we're the ones coming in, plugging the hole in the bottom of the mug, which we all would think that that makes a lot of sense to take care of that first. So. We're helping you know, our clients and their neighborhoods, their communities be more stable. We're helping them be more resilient during the more common extreme weather events that we're experiencing. Uh, affordable housing throughout most of Colorado is a big hot topic in local governments and local communities. And we're helping to preserve you know, existing affordable housing by making it actually affordable. Uh, there's a lot of other benefits that go along with the program that we do, including health conditions. You know, when we find that that leaking sewer pipe in the crawl space, and you know, identify that the mold is caused by that, and get that taken care of. I mean, there's a huge benefits for the overall health and stability of the people living in that home. Um, it's an important safety thing when we're mitigating, you know, fire risk and we're mi mitigating gas leaks and and that sort of thing. And then again, I mentioned earlier the environmental in impact. Uh, 4 million pounds of CO2 a year is about what we're keeping out of the atmosphere. So thanks for listening. Uh, do you have any questions? Howard, thank you so much as, as, as always an interesting conversation and. And educational, let me start with, so the request is 500,000. Uh, preferences is grant form uh, to cover 27 counties. And I, I know that I, I think you said that there was some flexibility. So if a funder says, you know, I, I like to designate a specific county, you have that, that ability. 
but just to, for, for full understanding, this is for safety repairs and uh, other repairs, as you mentioned, you know, adding, you can't, you can't really add insulation to an attic if the roof is leaking. Right. But because the federal funding will cover the insulation, but it won't necessarily cover the roof repairs. And that's the need for these spots. Is that correct? That's exactly right. And, you know, there are some limited health and safety funds through the Department of Energy grant that we use in this program, but they're, they're not uh, enough to cover the problems that we see on a daily basis. Okay, wonderful. And going back to one of the previous slides, I, I noticed that you listed solar panels. I guess it was in your first slide. Is, is that part of weatherization or another program? How does solar panels fit it? So we're now, you know, in conjunction with weatherization, you know, we'll make the home as efficient as possible. And then if the home allows, we'll add renewable generation to it. So it's a huge benefit for the client and it's a benefit for utility companies. We're getting uh, some subsidy from a couple of the major utilities in the state that are helping us uh, put the solar on the roof because, you know, if they can avoid building another electrical generation plant, you know, it's to their benefit as well. And they've run numbers on that and found that it's helpful, not only for the low income family, but for the utility as well. You know, and I also found it uh, informative as far as you were saying, we, we have households that their utilities are 30%, uh, correct me on this, 30% of their income in some cases. Yes, we've seen it even higher, Ariel. It's it's shocking, you know, there are a lot of people that really just struggle to survive every day. And, you know, we see them, you know, 2000 of them a year and, and, you know, they're not all in that dire situation, but boy, there are hundreds of people that we've encountered in the last year, especially with COVID that you just wonder how they, how they put one foot in front of the other. Oh my, okay. Well, we, we, we have about another 30 seconds or so, Howard, uh, before your time is up. Anything that uh, perhaps you'd like to emphasize uh, 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 or perhaps you, you, you went over fairly quickly during your presentation that perhaps you'd like to, to uh, share with the audience? Well, I think in general, I just appreciate that uh, the Federal Reserve Bank is pulling us all together here for this conversation. So hats off to, uh, to you and your team, Ariel. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm, actually, I'm not sure Tammy Edwards, who uh, is basically my boss and and the idea for investment connection is joining us as well. So hopefully she heard that as well. Uh, thank you very much. So, Howard, thank you. Um, yep. And so for the funders, again, uh, you have your funder response form and along with that in the uh, polling section. There is uh, all the proposals are listed. So this was Energy Resource Center. And if you'd like to connect with Howard or ERC, uh, opportunity there to mark yes or no. So if we can now move on to the next slide, please. Howard, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so next slide. Great, we have Cass Walker and Azarel Madrigal uh, Chase with First Southwest Community Fund. Cass, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ariel. We can go to the first slide. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cass. I'm executive director at First Southwest Community Fund. Um, I'm here with Azarel, and we're excited to talk to you a little bit about our work and a new fund that we have launching this summer. So First Southwest Community Fund, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we are headquartered in Alamosa in the San Luis Valley, and we serve all of rural Colorado with an emphasis on the southern and southwestern counties. We are the partner nonprofit of First Southwest Bank, which is one of the two CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution banks in Colorado. Together, we work to provide accessible capital uh, to our rural businesses. Um, the community fund uh, really focuses on those who are not able to get, ac get access to capital um, from traditional sources, whether that be a bank or other means. We work with startups, nonprofits, small businesses across our rural area 
um, our industries uh, across the board. We work with Main Street businesses, we work with technology companies, and we have a number of different loan programs and grant programs along with technical assistance and education that helps support these businesses to create our thriving rural economies. We also have a number of specialized programs. We have um, identified through strategic planning processes that there are a number of either populations or industries that need specifically targeted and specifically designed assistance when they're starting businesses. So we have created a number of programs that work with either these populations or industries to really co-design with that community what that program should look like. So some examples are our Rural Women-Led Business Fund, which is a $1.2 million fund that focuses on supporting women-led businesses, especially women of color in the San Luis Valley, and as a loan fund paired with education, such as workshops, accelerator programs, mentorship. Uh, we have a few other of those, and one of the funds we're gonna talk to you about today is a new program that we're launching under our specialized program umbrella. Next slide, please. Just to give you a sense of our impact, um, in 2020 alone, we invested nearly $7 million into our rural communities through both loans and grants. We did a lot on COVID response. Uh, we helped deploy CARES Act funding. We had our own grant programs, helping folks get um, their businesses up and running again, helping folks get access to an online presence. Um, in 2020 alone, we created nearly 2,000, oh, sorry, retained nearly 2,000 jobs and created nearly 113 new jobs, which uh, down in this rural area of the state is, is a lot. Um, as you can see from the types of business that we finance, we have a heavy emphasis on those who have been traditionally excluded from access to capital in the past, specifically women-owned businesses, BIPOC-owned businesses. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of our scope. Um, we are funded by uh, federal, state, and private foundation programs. We work with most of the major foundations in Colorado. So we have a number of different partnerships that help us achieve our mission and impact. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Azrael to talk about the program that we're hoping uh, to connect and collaborate with you on today. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Azarel Madrigal Chase, and I am the Ora Sarel, and I am the program director with First Southwest Community Fund. The program that we are asking for funding today is for the Fortaleza Fund. Fortaleza meaning resiliency in Spanish. Um, throughout this process, we talk to local partners that are currently serving the um, immigrant population. The Fortaleza Fund looks to support rural immigrant-led businesses. Uh, the local partners that we spoke to, because we we're looking to pilot this program in Region 9, uh, being currently being served by the immigrant population by the uh, group known as Compañeros, and the San Luis Valley currently being served by the SLB Immigrant Center. Uh, we spoke to them and some of their experiences with community members and um, entrepreneurs within the, the space of the population, immigrant populations that they serve, and they really identified this as a high need uh, through COVID and some of the um, Funding that came down for businesses, one big portion of the population, business population that was left out were these immigrant led businesses. Um, due to their legal status, this community faces a lot of obstacles in obtaining adequate capital to formally establish and grow their businesses. Um, according to the American Immigrant Council, 42,000 immigrant bus businesses accounted for over 12% of self-employed Colorado residents in 2018 alone. And that alone generated over $1 billion in business income. Um, through, these com through these additional conversations with these groups, we kind of developed a, a four-tier approach of, about how this fund would operate. The first would be, of course, a key access to capital piece that would come in the form of grants, as well as low interest, low interest Term, um, loans, excuse me, that would come with very favorable um, and accessible rates. Um, the second part is a technical assistance, education, and coaching, and looking at how can we, we can bring culturally competent um, education to build capacity in this historically, historically disenfranchised community that may need that extra support to establish your business. Um, the other part is the, our advisory committee. Um, we are really, we value being community led. And we really value that the folks who these funds are specialized funds are meant to serve, being the folks that are have a seat at the table and are actively co-designing and advising these funds. So we are looking at having a committee with stakeholders, entrepreneurs, and community leaders from across Region 9 and the San Luis Valley. 
Uh, today we are here to ask for an investment opportunity in the form of a two hundred thousand uh, dollar grant in a one hundred thousand dollar PRI um, investment. Thank you. We're happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much. All right, love it. Uh, so investment opportunity and again for the funders, don't forget you've got your Q and A option as far as for questions that you may have uh, for presentations. Uh, so let me kick off with um, first Southwest Community Fund. It, is it uh, a CDFI? It's part of the CDFI, so it is a CDFI, a great correct? Uh, we are not a CDFI, so the nonprofit itself is not a CDFI, but we are the partner of First Southwest Bank, which is a CDFI, CDFI bank to be specific. And part of that reasoning, when um, First Southwest Community Fund was founded in 2015, because the bank had CDFI status, they get a lot of the benefits through being a CDFI. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, by having this nonprofit partner as a complement, we're able to access different types of funding. So it enables us, us to have a really, really diverse portfolio of funding that we're able to bring in to be able to help folks in our rural communities. Give us an idea of, so you talk about, uh, so we have South, just so the audience has a full understanding of the geography that you're representing. Region yeah. 9, help us understand Region 9, San Luis Valley. Uh, yeah, absolutely. What's your yeah, so we're headquartered in Alamosa in the San Luis Valley, which is the sixth county region I think most folks are familiar with. Uh, Colorado's three persistent poverty counties also lie in the San Luis Valley. So a lot of the work that we do is targeted at very um, low income folks within that region. We also work across region nine, which is the Lake Durango, Pogosa Springs, Cortez, that region. So right down here in the Southwest. And then we do do work that stretches up to the Montrose region as well. Um, our mission is to serve all of rural Colorado, so especially last year during COVID. We did a lot more also in the Northeast um, of Colorado and our programs, most of them are eligible to folks from anywhere in a rural area. So we do not work in Metro, um, but yeah, we do have this focus on the Valley across as, as Ron mentioned, region nine. So that Durango, Pagosa region, and then across up to Montrose. Can you help us in regards to describing a, a typical business? So, you know, I, I can see it on this slide as far as immigrant led businesses. Uh, tell us about some of the typical businesses that you'd be working with. Yeah, as well, do you want to tell them about Taco Zacaranza? Yeah, definitely. Um, so our organization as a whole works with a high diversity of, of businesses, everything from what somebody might call the side hustle to somebody who wants to embark in a full time venture. Um, one example that we have piloted through one of our of our other funds, but it fits within the scope of work of the Fortaleza uh, fund is the, there is an immigrant led business out of Durango called Tacos La Carranza in um, they started out as somebody who was just kind of selling food on construction sites and moved on to uh, being able to finance a food truck. And that has been a very exciting process. And it also has been a really good learning process of what it would look like to kind of fund these type of businesses. Yeah, so we do everything in all industries from restaurants to yeah, regular Main Street businesses. We do a lot in healthcare, education, environmental. It's really across the board. For Fortaleza Fund, we definitely do see a keen interest in the food sector, um, as well as the construction and cleaning industries down here as well. I think there's often a misconception of rural Colorado that, um, you know, it's not as diverse as some of our metro areas, but especially in the San Luis Valley, many of those counties are over 50% Latinx. Um, and we have very large immigrant populations, both in the Valley and in the region nine Durango area as well. And as Azrael said, this has really been a population that's been overlooked, especially in the last year with COVID impacts. Um, so we're excited to work alongside our partners with Compañeros and the San Luis Valley Immigrant Resource Center to provide some support to entrepreneurs that we know from research are generally extremely successful. Immigrant led businesses are known to be highly, highly, you know, high growth successful. So we're excited. Give us an idea. So, uh, on the bottom of the slide, the 100,000 PRI or investment CD investment, what was that uh, ideally look like? What are, what are the yeah. terms that you'd, you'd like to see? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we are very familiar working with program related investments from the foundation space. Um, those work, you know, alongside kind of more regular investments um, from folks who are maybe not investing from a foundation portfolio. Um, ideally, we would like uh, these to be in the 0 to 1.5% 
range. Um, we, we do go up to 2% on some of our PRIs, but honestly, the lower we can get on that interest rate, the lower the interest rate we can give to the businesses, which honestly is the, like the impact piece of this. So ideally it would be with between that zero to 1.5% return on that investment. All right, guys, thank you very much for your presentation. So funders in thank the room, you. you go to your polling section and you can check on this uh, proposal, yes, no, or also you can use your funder response form and um, see what your, your uh, if, if this is a proposal that might be of interest. So uh, next slide, please. And we'll be chatting with uh, Katie McKenna uh, with Enterprise Community Partners. Katie, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you so much for having me today. You can go on to the next slide. Uh, I'm Katie McKenna. I'm a director at Enterprise Community Partners. We're a national nonprofit committed to advancing equity through affordable housing. So our vision is that one day everyone will have an affordable home in a vibrant community. And over the last 35 years, We've created more than 662,000 homes and invested 53 billion, impacting millions of lives throughout the country, including in the Rocky Mountain region. I'm based in our Denver office, and I work primarily here um, in Colorado, uh, Utah, Kansas, Nevada, kind of the Rocky Mountain region of our of our country. Um, our work here uh, focuses on investing capital, advancing policies, and elevating programs that are increasing access to affordable housing through a racial equity lens. So I'm here today to offer solutions and also an investment opportunity to a longstanding systemic failure in the affordable housing industry. Capital is power and power shapes communities. And today, both money and power of the affordable housing industry lies mostly with white developers, investors, and decision makers. 1% of senior executive real estate jobs are held by black men and even fewer by black women. And the nonprofit sector isn't even that much better. So 16% of community development corporations are led by black, indigenous, and people of color or BIPOC executive directors. And the leaders, that, that leadership disparity alone is something that's concerning, but when taken in combination with the high percentage of BIPOC residents who live and need live in and need affordable housing, as well as that most of our affordable housing is built and developed in BIPOC communities, this is a disparity we can no longer ignore. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. Um, majority developers bring a really critical perspective to the field. In many cases, they grew up in the communities that they're building in. They're intimately familiar with lives, culture, and challenges that residents may face. And uh, this perspective that they bring is ar arguably a little more people-centered than just financially centered. Uh, many BIPOC developers find ways to benefit uh, their communities within the projects. For example, Cecily King, who runs Kipling Development, is developing a mixed in income condo project that's in an upscale community. It's going to allow low income residents to own their property in an area with good schools and rising home values. And that, she says, is life changing for a family. She also says it's still a business at the end of the day, but the perspective that she's able to bring as a Black woman opens her eyes or others' eyes to the opportunities that exist. So earlier this year, as a solution to this challenge, earlier this year, Enterprise launched the Equitable Path Forward Initiative. Equitable Path Forward is a nationwide initiative to help dismantle the deeply rooted legacy of racism in the housing system. From the types of homes that are built, where they're built, who builds them, and also the wealth that's generated from them, it's a multi-pronged initiative and is set, um, to establish an equitable path forward um, for BIPOC developers as well as other historically marginalized housing providers using three different tools. So the first is filling the gaping capital gap from decades of systemic racism. The second is strengthening BIPOC housing providers and developers through advisory services and nonprofit and non-financial support. 
And then finally, creating new career pathways to diversify leadership in real estate and change the face of the industry as a whole. So my proposal today is focused on an initial $300,000 grant investment to, to work on the second pillar that's strengthening provider, providers through advisory services and other nonprofit, not non-financial tools for BIPOC developers. This is a local investment in advisory services that will be leveraged with flexible capital investments from enterprise, as well as career development opportunities provided by enterprise, both locally and nationally. And you can go on to the next slide. So with an eye towards or, and the goal of rebalancing power and profit in the real estate industry, starting with affordable housing, um, your investment in this initiative will support the Colorado Housing Advisory Services Program, which will be offered to BIPOC-led developers at various stages of readiness to help increase their capacity and ability to expand development. So we'll, we'll work with developers to identify the advisory services that can be that are needed and that can be provided internally by enterprise experts or hire consultants as needed to advance specific affordable housing projects. And we'll also work to help BIPOC developers to create business plans, solidify backend operate operations, um, hire and train staff, generally build their business so that development decision making and the wealth building that comes along with it lies more with BIPOC leaders than it does today. So this initial investment of $300,000 in grant funds will ensure that five BIPOC-led development organizations are supported and increase their development capacity to create or update um, more solid business plans and have growth management strategies in place and are generally comprehensively supported through the implementation of these technical assistance plans. At least two of the five organizations will have advanced development projects and will be well positioned to develop to be building new units in, in the region. So um, not only are we building the capacity of BIPOC developers, we're also increasing our affordable housing supply, which we all know is so critical. Um, all the while, Enterprise is working to improve our own formal and internal underwriting standards to ensure that inclusive to ensure inclusivity, um, including emphasizing staff experience and capacity over the balance sheet alone, along with other standards. And we're also working to help uh, throughout the industry um, to change these standards beyond just our own um, lending and equity capacity. So I invite you all to join us in paving the way for an equitable path forward. I'm happy to answer any questions and so appreciative of your time. Katie, thank you very much. And also a uh, reminder for uh, audience, we do have that Q&A section uh, if you'd like to submit some questions. And just as a programming note, we may have to drop out the uh, PowerPoint presentation just for a moment and they're gonna reload. So I'll let the team do that if they need to, and we'll just go ahead with some questions. So, Katie, first off, and 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 uh, you've used the term BIPOC, and I just want to, for our audience, uh, some that may not be familiar uh, with the term, if you wouldn't mind uh, explaining that, please. Yep. So, Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, in Colorado. We have a large Latin A population. We um, also work across the. Uh, state to really um, build capacity of Native American developers, both in um, uh, metro or uh, cities and towns, as well as um, in more rural parts of the state. And then, of course, um, uh, Black developers as well. Okay. And so the 300, uh, let's see, going back to the how will the 300,000 be used and where? So I, I think part of your presentation, you said you're looking at Denver Metro, but I wanna make sure uh, I got that. And, and just to confirm that this is to expand the number of um, um, developers of, of color in the field and that are working in the affordable housing space, just to make sure I've got that. 
Yep, you've got it. And thanks for going back to the slide. That's helpful. So um, we'll be working uh, primarily in Colorado, although we are open to uh, developers in uh, other parts of the region, particularly if investors have uh, connections and can help open those doors because our initiative is nationwide. Um, I'm based in Colorado, so most of my relationships and work is here. Um, and the, the specific grant funds will support uh, creating uh, uh, individualized technical assistance plans for these emerging developers so that they're able to uh, identify needs to build their business, connect them with the resources and technical assistance that they need, which will be both um, enterprise through our experience and staff capacity, as well as through uh, connecting folks with consultants when that's appropriate, depending on what the needs of the business are. And then all with the goal of um, both stabilizing, supporting and, and growing a development business along with creating uh, more affordable units. Terrific. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, all right. So again, uh, funders, you've got your under your polling question. If you'd like to make a connection with enterprise, please click. Yes, you also have your funder response form. Use that 1 Katie. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, next, we'll move to Christina Stimson is with Aurora interfaith community services. Christina, the floor is Hi. yours. Hi everyone. Thanks for thanks for having us, inviting us to this um, fantastic opportunity. So thrilled to be here. Um, let's go ahead. Yeah, my name is Christina Simpson. I'm the executive director for Aurora Interfaith or AICS. First slide. Thank you. There it is. All right. So AICS is a 501c3 nonprofit founded in 1968. Um, our mission to express Christian concern for our community by providing substantive uh, emergency assistance to the residents of Aurora. Uh, we serve the residents um, of Aurora that have hit hard times with a goal to help community members survive and rise out of their current situational poverty and bring them to a new, better life situation, which is different for every individual. Um, AICS currently has four main programs. Uh, we have food pantries, which are our largest program. Uh, and one for which we are requesting funding uh, today. We also provide utilities assistance, clothing vouchers, bus tickets, um, and also uh, community navigation support where we uh, talk with the participants um, to figure out uh, what other assistance uh, they need, what they need to get um, their lives to a different life situation that might be financial success, or it might be leading our participants to mental health um, counseling um, or to someone that can help them fill out their disability paperwork to get them to a better life situation. Uh, these wraparound services ensure that our clients have access to all of the resources they need. AICS has never uh, charged a fee for any of uh, our programs and services. Next slide, please. We are uh, seeking funding for AICS's food pantry programs, which address community members' most pressing need to feed themselves and their families. Prior to the pandemic, there was a great need for food assistance in Aurora. In 2019, 12% of Aurora residents lived in poverty, a higher rate than the state average of 9%. Food insecurity, which we define as having limited or uncertain access to adequate nutritious food, has long been an issue in Aurora. It's the reason our organization was founded. The impact of COVID-19 on hunger in Aurora and across Colorado has been devastating. Statewide data shows in 2019, 1 in 11 Coloradans experienced food insecurity. Well, then COVID-19 hit, and by the end of 2020, that rate uh, grew by 38%. Two in five Coloradans experienced food insecurity. Um, AICS, in 2019, we stood up real quick um, right after after the pandemic hit we partnered with the city of aurora and other nonprofit agencies um, to provide food and assistant needs in a safe fashion 
through a mobile um, drive through uh, food distribution. Um, and we serve six times more clients in 2020 than 2019. That need is still uh, holds precedent. We are very busy. We're doing our uh, food pantry in-house and also the mobiles. Um, we are fortunate to have received emergency funding from several resources last year and are seeking, seeking more. We are, let's see what slide I'm on. I have one computer and I go back and forth. So, okay, we are seeking 20,000 in funding. Um, $20,000. And funding, we our cost for each meal is twenty five cents. Um, so we are a very efficient organization. Ninety percent of our manpower are volunteers, um, and it is an amazing community uh, that we all work together in. Um, twenty thousand at a cost of twenty five cents per meal uh, would provide eighty thousand meals uh, to residents in need. In 2021, we're projecting to serve uh, enough, hand out enough food for people to uh, prepare 747,000 meals in their households. So um, any 20,000 amount, if there's multiple, that is, um, you know, just added up where our goal is 774,000, um, 20,000 makes 80,000 meals. Um, could we go on to the next slide, please? AICS has two food pantries, one brick and mortar, um, which is open four days a week. Clients come to us, we give them nine days uh, worth of food. And then our mobile food pantry, which we give five to 10 days worth of food. Um, it, what's really fantastic about this is we have come to together for our community, but also as a nonprofit community in Aurora, all of the nonprofits have come together to create a community hub at these mobile um, food pantry events where we provide pet food, baby supplies, um, and collaborating with other organizations to give people an option um, to find other resources that will lift them up to their next life situation. Um, with your support, AICS will serve 9,500 people. Uh, that's duplicated, so if they come more than once in a year, um, 747,000 meals. Thank you for your time. Let me know if you have any questions. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so. And, and funders, if you have questions, don't forget you've got the Q and A box uh, available for any questions. But let me say, can you help us understand the clients that you're serving and the geographic area? Where, where are they coming from? Uh, what what counties overall? And an understanding of the clients that you're serving. There's a lot of you know attention in the media and so forth as far as uh, folks working, not working, those kinds of things. Help us understand your clients. Yeah. Good question. Um, so the when we do a mobile food pantry, we let anybody that drive up, they receive food. It doesn't matter if they're our residents or not. Um, but for the majority, it's Arapahoe County is the highest uh, number comes from Arapahoe County. Then um, Adams County is the second highest. Um, you know, the surveys that we give out uh, to help us with our uh, community navigation programming, most uh, people are also in need of rental assistance um, and then utilities assistance. So the basic situation is people have lost their jobs. They don't they don't have the income that they used to. Um, and so those are the two additional higher uh, needs that we see. Utilities assistance and rental assistance. And help us understand so, and also from the food pantry. So you're receiving food from uh, the food bank as well. And do you purchase as well, or is that the food bank that does additional purchase and and provides to to supplement what's uh, donated? Yeah, great question. Well, prior to the pandemic, this is amazing to say. I've, I uh, 
the organization receives all of their food uh, from in kind donations from churches because we started in churches, businesses, and individuals. So that was one year ago. Um, with a six time um, increase in need, we have had to look outward. Um, we do purchase um, from places like Food Bank of the Rockies. We're also involved in purchasing from local Colorado farmers to help local um, business growth and support within our own community. Um, and it's just a mix of what's available and what funding is available and what food is available. Um, so it really, it depends on the month, right? It's like, which farmers have what produce and what is our what is our tried good stock looking like? Let's let's make some orders to make this happen with a great food basket. Very good. Yeah. What are, what are some other things that perhaps you'd like to, to highlight? Maybe you didn't have time during your presentation uh, to make sure that the listeners, the funders, yeah, uh, understand yeah. in regards to your services and and people that you're serving. Absolutely. Um, I've been with Aurora Interfaith for a year and a half now. And, you know, in the name, it's Interfaith Community Services. Um, but with that word community, if you, anyone ever comes visit us, um, they say we really do have a great internal community. Our volunteers have been with us for years. Um, so of our staff, it's just a joy. It's a place people want to be. And, and we hold that uh, very important to our culture, but also that also goes on to the people we serve. Um, it, it's just a fantastic um, community and organization. All right, Christina, thank you very much. So Thanks, funders guys. reminder under the polling section, if you'd like to connect uh, with AICS, just mark yes. And I understand they're gonna be uh, uh, upping uh, reloading the new polling question since this one's about to expire. So it may shift a little bit, but you'll have the opportunity for all eight proposals again. Uh, so next slide, please. And so we have uh, Sheila Mahoney and Lena Osmondson. Oh, excuse me, I think Lena's not going to be joining us for the session, but with Fro Florence Crittenton Services of Colorado. Sheila, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share about Florence Crittenton services uh, with you guys today. I appreciate everyone's participation and um, just grateful for uh, for for your interest. Um, I'm the director of strategy and evaluation over at Flow Crit. And the reason why I'm um, representing us today is because one of the things that we're going to talk about are just the fact that um, our organization is just constantly innovating and we're always having new opportunities for investment and, um, and innovation. And, and that's sort of part of what I work on with, um, with my fellow colleagues here at um, a leadership team. So um, I will get started by explaining uh, who we are and I'm sure some of you already know, but I'll get started. Um, could I have the next slide? Thank you. So Florence Crittenton Services is a very unique organization that serves uh, teen mothers and their children and their extended family members, young dads as well. Um, the organization, we are a nonprofit, but we have a very strong partnership with the Denver Public Schools High School. And so we all share as uh, one campus and our programs are coordinated together. However, we have separate budgets and we do, um, we have separate staffs and all of that stuff. Uh, Florence Crittenton Services, the nonprofit organization, has a staff of about 53 full-time uh, people, so you can kind of get the, the idea of, um, of our size. Um, so our mission, as it says here, is to educate, prepare, and empower teen mothers and their children. And our vision is to see that uh, teen families are becoming healthy and self-sufficient and becoming uh, strong communities uh, that, that can sustain themselves and, um, and grow uh, long after they leave our, uh, our program. Um, our program is what we call a two-generation service model, two-gen, and that, of course, means that we are providing comprehensive services for both the teen moms and the young children. We, are, um, we have training, we have uh, curriculum, we have uh, monitoring and evaluation of outcomes, for both groups. Um, and so both of them are our focus and we hope to see our moms graduate uh, from the high school 
um, ready to, to jump into a, a job or a training program or college if they're ready, um, and as well as their children being ready for a kindergarten or a preschool or whatever it's the next step in their, in their journey. So um, I will just say a little bit about the, uh, the population that we serve before I move on to the next slide. Um, I don't know if, if folks know, but um, every year here in Colorado, there's still more than 2,000 uh, babies born to teen mothers, um, which actually surprises me because um, we do hear that the, the population of that group is declining, and it is, um, but there's still a significant number because every year you have 2,000 more, and so um, at any given time, you probably have you know 7,000 to 8,000 uh, teen families um, in the state needing services. And as you can probably guess, it's a very vulnerable um, population, a very vulnerable community. Um, our young moms are usually ha have experienced severe trauma, um, abuse. Some of them are struggling with uh, mental health problems. Um, or, you know, drug addiction or, or other things like that, um, that sometimes contribute to the pregnancy and then also just um, make it very hard for our, for them to continue with their education um, and, and be a, an effective parent for their, for their young child. Um, and so that is what we do. We step in and we provide services that just kind of breaks that cycle for them. And so that our, they can uh, go ahead and, um, and graduate from high school and that will, you know, practically double their, their income, um, income earning power as they're able to graduate from high school at least, um, and often move them on, like I said. And then it also just uh, severely or significantly reduces the, uh, the probability that uh, the young mom or the child is going to continue in an abusive situation or um, live in poverty. So um, we have a lot of great outcomes in that way. Our moms come from four counties. Um, about 56% are from Denver. And then um, about 15%, give or take, uh, coming from um, Adams, Arapaho, and Jeffco. 38% um, of our moms uh, are experiencing either homelessness or they're about to experience homelessness. And um, as you can imagine, uh, with COVID, you know, our moms being 95% uh, young people of color, um, they have been severely impacted by COVID and uh, throughout the year. Um, you know, we saw our innovation in action and we saw a lot of um, a lot of ability to um, adapt our programs and be able to help continue um, serving these young moms as they were uh, struggling with, you know, increased uh, health risks, um, job loss and, you know, even more housing issues, uh, threats of being evicted and so forth um, and continued trauma. So we'll go into the next slide. So as you can see here, this is kind of the overall um, view of the, the issue that we address in, in our programming. Um, as you can see, uh, nationally, only about 38% of, of teen mothers will graduate from high school. With our program, um, we have an average graduation rate of 80%. So you can see that it, it, over, it more than doubles the graduation rate um, of this group um, every year. And as I said earlier, um, the average salary will increase um, by 47% actually, um, and can still increase more with additional training and, um, and higher education. And, uh, you know, all of our, our, almost all of our young moms are graduating with parenting skills because we're offering parenting classes, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then you can see here that we also have very significant impacts for our children. Um, we've got 90% of them having a full term healthy weight um, when they're born, and that is because of some of the services that we provide here on campus. Um, and, you know, we make sure that they're up to date on immunizations and well checks and uh, those that graduate um, in those, those that finish the program at, at age 5 are kindergarten ready. So we're very proud of all of these things. Um, I will go on now to talk a little bit more about uh, the program itself and what we offer. So next slide. Thank you. Um, so, as I said, our program is what we call a two gen model, two generation. And uh, with a two gen model, the Aspen Institute, which is, is a very well known, um, uh, you know, think tank for two gen uh, programming, identified five key elements of a successful two gen model. And here at Florence Crittenden Services, we have all of those. And I'll just kind of describe a little bit of each one. Um, in terms of, you know, the education and career pathways, as I said, we have an on site high school that is um, run by Denver public schools. And so any young mom can come and stay as long as she wants up to 
six or seven years if she needs to um, to graduate. Um, a lot of our young moms come and they're behind in their in their education and they need extra time. Um, a lot of them have really low le uh, reading levels, of course, and here we're able to provide additional support so that they can get the help they need to like um, be able to uh, to graduate. They can stay until they're 21 years old um, and then we have a transitions program after that too. So. Um, uh, we also have on site job certification programs uh, this year. We're featuring uh, phlebotomy and uh, so you can uh, take that course at, if you're a, a teen mom here enrolled in our program and get academic credit and then also get certified so that when you leave, you have not only a, your your diploma, but you have a certification for a, a job as well. Um, we also offer transportation assistance and we even have college credit classes here on site. Um, in the fall, we're going to be offering some ECE, early childhood education classes. So we're excited about that. Um, moms will be able to get some uh, ECE job training while receiving uh, college credit. So that's cool. Um, so that's one of the uh, factors, uh, one of the elements. Another important one, health and wellness. Here at our same campus, we also have an on-site clinic. And that is run by our partners, Denver Health who are awesome and they're providing all kinds of services, um, OBGYN, dental, mental health, uh, health education, all here on site for our young moms to access anytime. Um, so that has been a huge, uh, a huge blessing um, for our young moms and, and children, um, providing vaccines as well. And they've been a great partner through the management of COVID too. Um, so I will move on. Another key element, um, uh, social capital. So, of course, we know social capital is the ability to build um, uh, friendships and relationships, partnerships with uh, folks in your community, whether it be your family, peers, um, coworkers, other folks in your community, neighbors. And so, um, you know, our young moms who come to us don't have a whole lot of that. And um, as we work with them over time, we are able to help them build those partnerships um, as so that they can uh, end up um, uh, having a good community of support once they uh, graduate and transition out of our program. Of course, also another big one, we have early childhood education. So as I said, every young mom who comes to our program can bring their child, their baby, um, and, uh, and we provide uh, free childcare for the entire day uh, while they uh, participate in our programs, including high school classes and all other uh, supports that we provide. Um, so it's a 10 classroom ECE center. Um, it serves uh, babies for um, as young as six weeks old. So as soon as a young mom is uh, finished with her maternity leave, she gets a six week maternity leave at our program when she gives birth. She can come and, and have her baby being attended to by highly trained, um, very high quality uh, uh, teachers. And, um, and we have a coach and everything. We are Colorado Shines rated um, level four. So that's almost the very top. So we're very high quality center and very proud of it. Um, we also offer- Sheila, thank you so much for your presentation. My goodness, oh, there my is God. a okay. lot to cover. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. Thank so you. thank you very much. Certainly do appreciate it. Uh, we've kind of run out of time for questions, but. Um, oh gosh, I didn't realize I talked so much. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's quite all right. That's quite all right. So funders, just as a reminder, uh, on your polling, so if uh, Florence <laughs> Crittenton Services of Colorado is of interest, mark yes. Uh, you can do that on the polling side, or you also have your funder response form that you received via email. Uh, you can certainly complete that and email that to us. So wonderful, Sheila. Thank you very much. Yeah, for thank you so much. Presentation. Apologies um, again. Next stop. No, no problem. Next, we have Dr. Jamie Reif with Metro Denver Homeless Initiative. Dr. Reif, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ariel. I appreciate it. And again, it's just a pleasure to be here today to share this opportunity with all of you. If you go to the first slide, please. All right. So what is the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative? So as our name indicates, we are an organization that serves the seven county Metro Denver region. We are the continuum of care in Metro Denver, meaning what we do is we really work to coordinate a response to homelessness throughout the region. And that includes things like um, we're the data stewards of what's called the homeless management information system, which tracks people moving from homelessness into housing stability. We work to match people with housing resources across the region and coordinate those housing resources. We provide technical assistance and professional learning. 
Um, and really what we do is we are the support for over 100 agencies in our region, again, that are looking to address and end homelessness. So let's talk a little bit about the need and, and what I'm going to refer to as the Housing Stability Flex Fund. So what does homelessness look like in our region? And I think this is a question, you know, we get asked a lot. So what I've got there is really um, what are called the point in time numbers. So this is an annual count we do every year. And what we see year after year is that homelessness has been steadily increasing in our region. And I will tell you the 2021 numbers are currently being crunched and um, being sent to HUD. And we again saw an incredibly significant increase this year um, and some things that are absolutely historic. Below that, I think is a much more comprehensive number. So that those point in time numbers are one a one night snapshot. This next number is how many people our provider agencies were able to support related to homelessness or someone becoming at risk of homelessness over the past year. So with our homeless management information system, we're actually able to longitudinally track people and look at different points in time on a daily ongoing basis. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that we don't talk a lot about is a number of children and youth experiencing homelessness. So one in four of these 32,000 individuals is a child or a youth. Um, and this doesn't include, um, you know, like our school districts also track this data in the state of Colorado every year, they identify a little over 24,000 students experiencing the McKinney-Vento Department of Education definition of homelessness. Next slide, please. So the question I get asked a lot is what can my organization or what can I do to directly impact homelessness? And I'm going to talk about that today and give you an answer to that. So we established something called the Housing Stability Flexible Fund. And really what this does um, is answers the question, how can we rally together to be able to prevent and end homelessness for households? So a little bit about this fund. It was originally founded by the Metro Mayor's Caucus, which is, um, for those of you unfamiliar, is a regional coalition of about 38 member mayors. And it's kind of become this, this rallying point for our community. And the reason that is, is it's because it's a nimble but for fund, meaning we can quickly get funds out the door. And people that apply for this fund, they have to go through their case manager through one of those partner agencies. And they are only eligible if they've exhausted all of their avenues. So these are people that would, but for this account, either continue to, to be homeless or they would, um, they would fall into homelessness. So it's a but for fund. And what we've seen, is, particularly over the last year, is really this growing support as well as a growing need. So you can see there, I, I put in some of the logos. Um, the city of Denver um, has supported this as well as the majority of the 38 member mayors. And then recently we were awarded out of 140 applicants, the top award by the Wells Fargo Community Wins Grant in um, collaboration with the US Conference of Mayors for about $300,000. The state of Colorado has supported this through the COVID-19 Relief Fund, as well as others like the Denver Foundation, Kaiser Permanente, and Mile High United Way, um, just because they see how, again, how incredibly impactful this fund can be. Let's talk a little bit about the impact and what this fund does. So it provides prevention of homelessness, so like rental assistance, and we've heard a lot of the other speakers talk today about how that's the number one need of their clients is kind of some eviction prevention as well as rental assistance. Move-in costs that are paired with other federal programs where maybe they don't cover first month's rent or security deposit, as well as landlord mitigation. And so one of the things that we've seen through this fund is that we're able to assist a household with a little bit over $1,200 on average. And what I'll say is something like preventing homelessness for about $1,200 is significantly more effective than the somewhere between seven and $10,000 it takes to re rehouse someone. Um, with this fund, we've seen it grow significantly. So you can see in 2019, we had about $126,000 in contributions. 2020, we kind of doubled that. And then this year, we expect to double that again. Um, to support, you know, upwards of about six to 700 households. So what is the need? One thing I will say is with the onset of COVID, we have seen so many people who have never, ever had housing instability or were at risk of eviction coming to us for support. And we saw about a 350% 350, 350 increase in asks. 
And as many as you know, the CDC eviction moratorium will be expiring. Um, they just did ex extend it today for another month. But when that does expire, we're walking up on an eviction cliff. And right now in the state of Colorado, we have about 78,000 households um, at facing um, eviction. And what I'll say is that, again, a lot of these households um, are newly facing this type of crisis. Next slide, please. So what is our proposal? So what we're trying to do ultimately is really um, prevent homelessness as well as work to end homelessness. And we have some really great opportunity with some of the federal resources flowing into the region. And ultimately, we'd like to grow the Housing Stability Fund to about 1.5 million annually. We're about halfway there this year. Um, and so we're coming today is with an ask for about a $100,000 grant. And what we're hoping is that we, if we get to this $1.5 million annually, we're literally looking at thousands of people becoming housed or avoiding homelessness each year, as well as saving our homeless response system um, millions of dollars and preventing trauma. So outcomes of this fund, we track everything through our homeless management information system um, and are, actually have dashboards and can see at the client level, again, um, returns to homelessness or, you know, kind of long-term longitudinal outcomes. And then the opportunity really with this, again, is to just show that your organization is meaningfully dedicated to investing in combating homelessness and assuring housing stability across our region. Jamie, thank you so much. Certainly do appreciate that. Let's go into questions. So again, reminder, uh, funders, you have a Q and A if you'd like to submit a question. Uh, Jamie, let me kick, kick it off. You had uh, in your slide two in regards to landlord mitigation. Mm -hmm. Is that right to counsel? What do, what, what does that yeah. include? As far Great as question. Well? So um, literally, we just got a request for someone that's been staying outside for five years. And the reason that they couldn't um, move into a new place is because a landlord had a judgment against them from before they were experiencing homelessness for some damages. And so through the fund, we're able to pay those damages to the landlord um, to ensure that this person can now be housed. Okay. Very good. All right. And then ge geographic area um, that, that, that yeah. you're covering as far as how many counties? Yeah, great. It's the seven county Metro Denver region. I'll run through them. It's Adams Arapahoe. Jefferson, Douglas, Denver, Boulder, and Broomfield. <laughs> okay, terrific, terrific. And and then let's see, looking for questions. Anything, I know it's always a short time, the seven minutes yeah. to present and so forth. Sure. Anything that you'd like uh, the audience as far as a, a, a takeaway before we wrap? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that we don't often talk about is that affordable housing and, and this type of insecurity is the number one cause of homelessness. And I think this is really important because many of us are just so excited. I don't know about all of you about coming out of COVID and being able to go see family and friends. Um, and I will say for this population, COVID is just beginning. The economic impact um, is just beginning. And so if something isn't done, it's going to be absolutely um, staggering what this does to our local economy. Yeah, no, the numbers are certainly troubling and also in one of your charts, I guess you had 24% is, is children and youth. And that's also again, quite high. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Reif, thank you very much. Uh, funders you. again on polling side, if you've been using that, now's your opportunity to click uh, yes or no as far as if this proposal is, is of interest for you. Thanks so much for forwarding the slide. Uh, appreciate that. So. First off, thank you to all the presenters uh, today, and, and I hope you'll agree that uh, a lot of great uh, information, uh, incredible work that's taking place in our throughout our state, and a lot of passion and commitment that you can see, and a lot of need, a lot of funding need that's out there, a lot of opportunities that are out there for you as funders. Uh, so quickly, a couple of things. Uh, the funder response forms, as I said, those were emailed to you yesterday. Hopefully some of you uh, uh, were following along with that. We've also had the polling option, so that is still open. We're going to be closing that in just a moment because we, we're going to be putting up the evaluation. So, Alex, if you can go ahead and put the evaluation up. And my understanding is it's going to be uh, broken down by question. So if you could complete that uh, evaluation as well, that helps us with future investment connection programs and uh, other programming that might be of interest to you. So I wanna make sure that we have that. So funder response form, evaluation, both of those, were, as I said, were included in the email, but please, if you could complete that, that helps us know, you know, how are we doing? 
and uh, you as an audience as, as our constituents, uh, how can we help you and what would be the best resources that we could share with you? Also, if you've made a funding connection through investment connection and don't think we're aware of it, please let us know because as you know, what we do is we share all the yeses that you've you've said you'd like to learn a little bit more. Again, not a commitment to fund, but you'd like more information. We share that with the presenters, and then they're supposed to uh, then follow up with you uh, to basically uh, make a connection, answer any questions, so forth, and see if there's some opportunities for uh, an ongoing relationship. So we have some organizations I have to tell you that have connected with funders, and for you know ten years have have been working. Uh, continuously with, with their uh, uh, making changes in the community. So also, uh, any connections? We're always looking for article ideas. Uh, next slide. So in addition to the eight proposals you heard today, uh, we have hundreds more on our Investment Connection Funder website. So check us out on Investment Connection. And those of you that haven't been on the site, you basically click your geography. Uh, it could be state level, county level, what have you. You pick your area of focus uh, that's of interest and you know also you can put funding support if it's grants loans investments uh, service uh, that you're looking for volunteer opportunities and the site will then populate with uh, those proposals that fit your match so uh, let us know if you have any questions about the tool please you've got my email information also on the slide so again thanks to all of you for attending today if you wouldn't mind, please completing the evaluation that's on your right. Uh, click on that and basically submit. And uh, there's there's uh, about three or four questions there. Certainly would help us. Um, please check out the website in regards to investment connection. Oh, I also included CRA one source. So for those of you that have questions in regards to the CRA and upcoming changes, um, we can certainly, uh, uh, you can find that information. As many of you know, we're going through a process of CRA modernization. And so check out the site. We will be posting uh, information as it becomes available with that. So again, thanks to all of you for joining today. Hope you came away with uh, more information on organizations that are working in our communities and ways that you may be able to support them. Uh, Justin, Alex, if you can move all the presenters back to the staging room. I would appreciate it. We're adjourned. Thanks so much.